think he's gonna, it's going to take too long, right? About his third, maybe 30 minutes max or something. Like that. I can't put a time on it, but it shouldn't take a really long time. Okay, so we are in Matthew chapter 17, and we are looking at verse 14. Matthew 17 and verse 14 as we continue our journey through Matthew here. And it says, I'm reading from the ESV, And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. So, um, a couple of things <coughs> jump out at me about this text. First off, Matthew chapter ten and verse one, uh, when when Jesus had, had had sent the apostles off on the limited commission, I remember when he sent them off. They had been given the power to cast out demons. In Matthew chapter ten and verse one, it says, and he called. Uh, to him his twelve disciples gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So this isn't the first time that the apostles uh, had attempted to cast out demons. However, what makes this attempt different was that it was actually unsuccessful. And I noticed that they actually went to him privately and asked him uh, about this. And it seems to be a difficult faith testing experience for for his disciples here um jesus had been away from them he was if you remember he was up on the mountain right with with uh peter james and john but while he was up on the mountain up on the mountain the ministry was still continuing on and they were they were doing their work and they were out teaching and healing but they hit a wall here and it, it was a real test of faith. And, and that really seems to be what Jesus addresses here, this, this problem of, of unbelief. And I find that curious because I think if anyone's believing in, in Jesus, surely it, it's his disciples, right? And yet, you know, <clears throat> throughout this study, we have made several connections back to Moses. Uh, going up on the mountain and now as Jesus is coming back down the mountain Do you remember uh, the first time that Moses went up on the mountain to uh, to receive the law? When he went up on the mountain and do you remember what he found when he came back down the mountain? That first time Moses when Moses went up to get the law and then he came back down Do you remember what what he saw? That first time right the first time uh, he came down, he, he saw the Israelites had kind of gone head over heels into idolatry, right? Into, into sin. They had created the golden calf, and they were worshiping that calf. And, and they caused such a ruckus that Joshua was concerned that they were being attacked. He was afraid that maybe there was a war going on. And so, if you were going to sum up that generation, if you were going to describe that generation that, that Moses met when he came down the mountain, what are some words that you might use to talk about that generation? You might like faithless or adulterous or twisted, perverse. And now Jesus comes down the mountain here in Matthew and this man comes running up to him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures, and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire, and often into the water, and I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. 
And in Matthew's account, Jesus uh, responds, O faithless and twisted generation. So Jesus comes down from the mountain, and he too comes headlong into faithless, twisted generation. Just as Moses had come down from the mountain and came headlong into a faithless and twisted or perverse generation. Now, with Moses, as we pointed out a moment ago, it was because of their idolatry. Even though they had witnessed and heard the voice of God from the mountain, and what was the very first thing that God had said to them from the mountain? You shall have no other gods before me. All right. And the second thing was, you shall not make yourself uh, for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is the earth or uh, in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And so here are these first two commandments and. I mean, within days or, or weeks of having heard that, now they're not abiding by that. They're faithless and twisted and perverse, and they're going into idolatry. Now, Jesus had gone up on the mountain, and he had left the, apostle, the apostles behind, some of the apostles behind, who he had given authority over demons and healing. And now he comes back down to find that they weren't able to do it. And his reaction is, oh, faithless and twisted generation. And I guess the question becomes, well, who is this generation that Jesus is complaining about? Now, it's possible that it's the man who's, who's coming up and asking, because in Mark's account, Mark chapter 9, verse 21 in Mark uh, chapter 9 and verse 21, it says, And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. Notice this. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If I can... If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. So I know that the man who's asking has his own faith struggles. But who else does Jesus accuse of having faith struggles? It seems to be these disciples because in verse 19... Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. And I appreciate the fact that the New King James Version has that statement, uh, This kind does not come out except for prayer and, and fasting. And then that almost gives the idea that even though the apostles have been given authority, it's kind of like they've forgotten where that authority comes from. They should have been entreating God and relying on him. But now, maybe what they're doing is relying on themselves, turning, maybe turning their, their gaze away from God. Which, if that's true, that, that's, a whole, that's a whole lot like the, the children of Israel who were building that statue and calling it Yahweh. But they're having this faith struggle, and Jesus' frustration comes out. Oh, faithless and twisted generation. And he talks about, you know, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed. It's not faith in yourself. It's not faith in faith. But it's faith in God. And at this point, the apostles may have had a misplaced faith. Wow. And taking it on themselves to be able to do these things. Not appreciating that it's God. Which... That's, that was the problem with Peter, if you think back on that. That was the problem with Peter walking on the water. You know, that's, that's something that he can't do. He can't walk on water. But there he was, walking on the water, until he started looking around at the wind and the waves. And now it's like he's focusing on himself and what he can do or what he can't do instead of having faith in Jesus. And so he starts to sink. 
And of course, his response was to reach out to Jesus and call out for Jesus, which is what all of our responses should always be, right? We should always be reaching out. If we're sinking, we need to be calling out for Jesus. Now, here's the point that I think we really need to get from this. When Moses came back down the mountain, he found faithless, twisted generation dancing and playing before an idol. And his response to that is, I'm going to go atone for you. And that's when he goes up and he prays to God to forgive them. He says, even if you have to blot my name out of your book. And, and God says to Moses, that's not going to work. You, you can't do that. Listen, I'll forgive who I forgive and I'll, I'll, pay, I'll punish who I punish. But you can't stand as a sacrifice and the atonement. But here we've got Jesus who has now been talking with Moses and Elijah about his exodus. He, he's already told the apostles uh, as, as he's coming down the mountain, don't tell anybody about this until after I'm raised from the dead. And we're starting to get all of that as, as we're starting to piece all that together. But now... What's Jesus' next step? His next step is to come down when he meets the faithless and the twisted generation. His next step is, I've got to go make atonement. And the difference between Moses and Jesus is that Jesus can actually pull that off. Jesus can actually do that. And so... And one final application I just want to say here, and I'm going to let you guys give me a comment or two if you have any, but one final application I had on this section was what we see is that Jesus isn't causing a dividing line between those who, who measure up and those who don't. It, it, it's who's putting their faith in him. Who's putting their faith in him. That's, that's the thing, those who are and those who aren't. And who is Jesus, who does he need to atone for? He actually needs to atone for everyone, including the disciples, right? He needs to atone for, for everyone. So those are my thoughts on that section. So what do you guys think? Y'all have any thoughts on that? Yeah, anytime it, you have stuff like that that's uh, affecting children, that does make it hard. I think it makes it a little bit harder on us. Marcia, did you say, did you have something? Um, when Moses had gone up to the mountain, then he came back and his face was really bright. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, his face could shine as the sun in the tree. Yes. Yep, that's exactly right. And you see that connection. There's so many things when you look back at, when and you know you bring it in because you see Moses and you see Elijah or Elijah and you see Jesus and then you start looking back at Moses and things and, and the things that he did like the the shining face and so forth and then you see Jesus and you can start seeing these connections. It's pretty it's pretty neat to see how it's all connected like that. So when Jesus sent them out to begin with. When he, uh, in pairs, he endowed them with um, some gifts. Mm -hmm. And we call that the limited commission, right? Yeah. So I guess part of my confusion over there, I've always wondered, did, was that limited in not so much scope, but time? When they came back, they no longer practiced those things. Because do we see anywhere in the Gospels, after they come back, that they worked any miracles? Until, in fact, after the day of Pentecost, when they're imparted with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I've, that's what I've always taken to be, is just during that time while they were gone. Because as far as I know, 
until then, they don't really work any, but they were out doing stuff. They were out trying to heal and, and so forth. So, I mean, because right here, they're trying to do it, but they're, they're not being successful. But we do call that the limited commission. But it would be interesting if, if, they, if they no longer have those abilities to go out and heal, but they're trying to yeah, do something they can't know, do. But Jesus still seems to be harsh with them because of their lack of faith. Yeah, that's interesting. But after all, they are walking with Jesus. They are. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. So that's a, that's a really interesting point to think about. Yes, sir. Uh, try, uh, right. Uh, so assuming that it's carnal, I'm just kind of in, in line with what Johnny was talking about. I think, I guess I've never heard that uh, considered the limited commission. That's kind of a new uh, title. I've never heard that before. The only thing I would add is that if we're assuming that the book of Luke is written chronologically, we see in, ver in chapter 9, the same case of Jesus healing the demon possessed boy, and we can assume that because he says, "You uh, in verse forty-one, you unbelieving and perverse generation." Um, but then we also see in chapter ten, Jesus does send out the seventy-two, um, and the in verse seventeen it says the seventy-two returned with joy and said, "Lord, even the demons submit it, submit to us in your name." Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that necessarily totally lines up with uh, it expiring at that moment. Um, but I do think it's a lot, personally, I think it's a lot closer to what you had mentioned at first. They were probably getting a little confident or cocky in their own ability because they were probably witnessing miracles on a daily basis and it began to uh, become maybe uh, the, the work of the apostles, you know? And... Um, Potentially, that's why Jesus rebuked them. Is that he? He said, "Look, I gave you, the, I gave you these special powers <laughs> to to help spread the word and, and show the the works of the kingdom. But you know, even my apostles became part of this crooked and perverse generation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just my two cents on it. Yeah, that's and and that's definitely possible. I'm gonna cut you off. No, you're. <laughs> I think I mean, just a little different take. I always ask myself, why did why did we read this? Why did the Holy Spirit is just easier for us to see? And and I often wonder, well, here's the apostles. I mean, people following after Jesus, Jesus is right, works right with, and they're short of faith. No wonder I struggled with it at times, or others struggled with it at times. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, to me, it's 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 telling. It's telling me that uh, I'm weak too, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even the apostles had trouble with it at times. Yeah. So uh, I question, you know, that he's actually rebuking them necessarily, mm -hmm. but he's making them aware. Hey, you all got to have more faith. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I think uh, that's a good point as far as. We're going to struggle at times. And I love the guy. I love how he says, uh, help my unbelief. You know, because I think we've we've all been in those situations before where we've struggled with our faith or our belief. And when you say that prayer, I think that's something that can really, uh, that we can all honestly say, help my, help my unbelief. Because I believe, help my unbelief. So, and everybody can struggle with that at different times. Well, we, but, see, we see that every day. When you see come up, all of a sudden something very... Uh, hard hits us, mm -hmm. and what happens? We half the time, you know, we go off the deep end before we stop and realize, hey, God's in control, and I don't have to worry about it. You know, He'll help me with it. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the more you're, the more you're in the Word, the the stronger you get. What is that? What was that post that was shared? Did Sarah? I think Sarah shared that post about the tea that if the tea bag sits in the tea long enough, it, the tea gets stronger, and if you sit in the Word long enough, it gets stronger. Yeah, I like that. I think that's kind of the idea. The more we spend time in God's Word, the stronger our faith can be. And the more we spend time with like-minded Christians, the stronger our faith can be. I think we all need that encouragement. We all need that to trying to try, trying to grow our faith together. So, good points. I guess I have one more little tidbit. I guess within context, more people witness this demon possession being addressed than potentially would have been uh, witnesses to it if the apostles had taken care of it. That's pure speculation, but clearly there was a crowd there, 
And it even says, uh, again, in Luke's account, in verse 43, while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, and then he kind of talks about his, uh, his death again. So it, it would make more sense to, you know, kind of closer in line with what Gary was saying, I guess, of not necessarily rebuking them, but potentially the unbelief of the man. That's why it says, you know, bring your son to me. Kind of end his quote there. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, when you talk about how there were people around, because it seems like in these settings, it's a little different than what we're used to. You know, we're not used to these crowds always kind of being around us, but I think there, that was kind of a common common thing, where you would have people around. And so, and plus, you're definitely going to have people around these apostles and, and Jesus and uh, anything that's around Jesus, they're going to be around him. And of course, the apostles are a part of that, so they're going to be around him. So yeah, I'm sure that it seems like there was a pretty decent crowd about anywhere they went. You know, he had to, Jesus had to really go away to, to get away, and it, uh, that didn't always work either, right? All right. Well, if there's nothing else on that, we'll go to uh, verse 22. I'll try to let's start with 22. And we'll try to wrap up uh, this chapter here. Uh, verse 22 says, "As they were gathered, or as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, "The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and they will, and and he will be raised on the third day." And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? And he said, Yes. And when he came to the house, Jesus spoke to him first. I always think that's interesting. Jesus spoke to him first. <laughs> what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So I'm guessing all this happened around April 15th, since it's around tax time. Right? No, probably not. <laughs> so there's a couple of things that are going on here, though. The first is that. Again, in Matthew's account, Jesus is prophesying his death and resurrection. And then there's this interesting miracle where Jesus sends Peter on a, on a fishing expedition to go find this one particular fish. And inside its mouth, he'll find a shekel to pay the taxes with. Now, it's interesting when the tax collectors come up to Peter and ask him, does your teacher pay the tax? Peter says, yeah, of course. You know, of course he, he, he does. Uh, he's making, I believe he's making an assumption here. I mean, my master loves God and my master's faithful. He faithfully follows God. And there's this tax uh, to be able to use the temple and, and that supports the temple of the Lord. So, of course, Jesus is going to pay this. So he, he, he's just assumed that Jesus is going to do this. Um, so he goes into the house, and like I said, I think it's interesting that he didn't even have to say anything. He might have been mulling it over. And Jesus speaks first, and he has a, a different lesson, I think, to teach Peter here. Uh, remember what Peter has already confessed about Jesus back in Matthew 16, verse 13. He asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. All right, so Peter, you've confessed that I'm the son of God. Here on earth, do kings make their sons pay taxes or do they make everyone else pay taxes? Everyone else, all, all the strangers, all the, all the others. No king is going to make his son pay taxes. The taxes are supposed to come from the people to support the king and, and his household. This is the blessing of being king. It's, it's good to be king, right? So 
What he's really saying is, remember your confession, Peter? I'm the son of God. I'm the son of God. So whose house is this? This is my house. I'm the son of God. If this is God's house, then this is my house. Remember Jesus, even as a child, when he, he was left behind in Jerusalem and Mary and Joseph finally found him, what did he say to him? Why did you come to seek me? Did you not know that I'd be in my father's house or, or about my father's business? And so it does seem like if anyone should get a pass on paying the tax, it would be Jesus. But Jesus goes ahead and pays it. And he gives Peter instructions for a miraculous catch that'll, that'll just be enough coinage there for him and Peter. And, and of course, that, that's, that within itself is a pretty fascinating thing. Now, it doesn't go on to tell us that all that happened, but the implication is that Jesus sent Peter out to do these things, and, and Peter did it. And notice he says, in order not to give offense to them, in order not to upset them. And I can't help but think back just a couple of chapters earlier in Matthew 15 and verse 12, after he had, after he had talked to them about eating with unwashed hands. Y'all remember that? And he says, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that, that defiles a man. Then, he, then his disciples came and said to him, do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And Jesus' response was, so, who cares? Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leads to blind, both will fall into a ditch. So, on that occasion, he didn't really seem to mind offending the Pharisees. It's, it's almost like he doubled down on being offensive. He doesn't seem at all worried about offending in Matthew 15, but here in Matthew 17, he is concerned about giving offense. It is, it is the same word, and that word is the one that, that can mean to cause someone to stumble or cause someone to sin, but it doesn't seem in these passages that Jesus is talking about causing other people to sin. I think he's using it in the sense that we've use that word, that we use that word offense today, upsetting someone or making them angry or hurting their feelings or putting them off. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He wasn't saying, don't you know that you made the Pharisees sin because of that? No, what he was saying was, don't you know that you upset the Pharisees? And Jesus said, I don't care. Now, I guess it's more possible here that Jesus is saying, well, I don't want them to sin. I mean, it's possible, but it sure seems to me to, to still be that kind of idea. Lest I upset them, lest I needlessly place some barrier between them and me, let's go ahead and pay this. And I've often wondered why Jesus sent Peter to get a shekel from a fish when he could have just snapped his fingers and produced a shekel. That's, that's an interesting, maybe you guys have an idea about why he did that, did it that way. But either way, he's going to pay it. So one time he's not worried about offense, and another time he is concerned about offense. And it reminds me of a question that I saw on Facebook some time ago. It said, when I was a kid, I heard sermons that said, you shouldn't care about what other people think. And then I heard sermons that said, you should care about what people think. And I don't know what to think. <laughs> and it seems like we've got Jesus right here showing us both of those things. One time, he didn't care. And the other time, he did care. So, I don't know, did the second bell ring or is that just first? Okay. Um, so, what's the, what's the difference here? One thing that comes to my mind is the Pharisees were the leaders, the rulers, and scribes. The tax collectors worked for the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of like, uh, if I don't get what I want or need, then something's coming down on my head from the bosses. Yeah. 
Yeah. Does anybody have any other ideas or thoughts about uh, what Jesus, why he kind of cares in one scenario and doesn't seem to care in the other scenario? I think this would be really hard to explain to the Pharisees. You know. Yeah. Why would you tell them that? Yeah. You guys aren't, that, you know, you're not a, a son of the kingdom or son of God. Or, I mean, he definitely was higher than, than anybody, but I'm just saying, how would you explain that? I yeah. think it was just a matter of, we're not going to go there. We're not yeah. going to dig that up. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good that's a good point. I kind of had that same uh, thought too. Is, is it's kind of like a um, one of my thoughts was it's not a it's it's kind of a it's not my time moment here. Um, that there was you know there's some things uh, that we learn that at that particular moment there's different times where he says don't tell anybody. You know this isn't the time to do that. If Jesus were to or if Peter were to say, well, of course he doesn't pay the tax. He's the son of God. You know, that, that brings up something that's, uh, that it may not be time for him to do that yet. He wants to be a good example to people who've got to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus never was, other than, you know, he's the son of God, but physically speaking, he didn't try to make himself great mm -hmm. physically, you know. Yeah. And, it was all about right and wrong, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Like, like offending other people, he had a principle. It's like I don't care what they think. I got, I got to tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas taxes, well, why, why get in trouble with that? Yeah. You know, you should pay your taxes. And you know what? By all rights, he shouldn't have to pay taxes because he's the son of God. That's his house. The temple is his father's house. His house, and so that comes down to his rights. But Jesus wasn't all that concerned about his rights. He's willing to give those up and for the sake of peace and moving forward. And I think, yeah, go ahead. Uh, mine just kind of a funny recognition of the fact that Matthew, the ex-tax collector, is the only one <laughs> brought up paying the taxes. That is kind of funny. <laughs> it is funny. And I have some other thoughts on this too, and we may get to those next time around. Does anybody else want to say anything? Because everybody's ready to come in here. Does anybody else have anything to add before John lets them in? Thank you guys.